Um, I'm Eric Drass. Uh, I'm an artist, and um, this is me speaking at Pi Data last year. Um, I paint pictures, and I make generative art things that live on the web, do installation work. So I use a bit of code, which is the small legitimate reason why I'm here. Um, as you can see, back then I was wearing an eye patch because I'd recently fallen off my bike and broken my head. Um, thankfully, it's somewhat better, but not 100%. So if I'm squinting a little bit, it's, you know, please forgive me. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is what I call algo culture, uh, which is algorithmically generated culture. Um, culture is generally expected to be a kind of uniquely human phenomenon, uh, but it's changing. Algorithmic things are getting involved. Uh, this is the uh, definition from E.B. Tyler, who's a Victorian uh, anthropologist, and so he calls culture that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, and other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. Um, what I'm getting at is it's no longer just men or humans. There are machines getting involved in the system. Um, somewhat provocatively, uh, I tend to think of culture as an organism, uh, which is instantiated in all of us humans. If aliens came down this evening while we're listening to an umpire band and zapped all our minds, uh, we'd be back to banging rocks together. Right? There would be no innate culture sitting inside our brains. Um, so it's better to think of the fact that we're each instantiating a little bit of culture across the planet. Um, and more and more, these lovely MacBooks that you're holding is also instantiating bits of culture. It's living in your browser cache. It's living in data centers in the middle of the desert. That's also stuff that is part of human culture, but doesn't live in humans. Um, and this is part of the problem. Um, we don't really know uh, where this stuff is living anymore. It's not clear where the source of the culture is coming from. Um, this is a lovely little human generating some data. Um, there's some more humans also generating some data. Um, and there's now bots sitting around generating data as well. Um, it's not always clear from the outside which kind of thing you're interacting with. Um, when there's lots of bots and lots of humans making lots of data, it becomes even more difficult. Um, and we have algorithmic systems sitting up in the sky, looking at this output of this data, looking at these Twitter streams, looking at these Facebook posts, not really knowing whether it's actually generated by humans or not. Um, the problem gets you know, bigger as you scale up. We've got sets of algorithmic systems reading this data, and then we have a meta level of other systems reading the outputs of this level of bots. And what I'm trying to address in this talk is, what is this guy thinking? What's going on in his head? Um, what is it like to be a bot? Um, I'm going to use uh, a little crash course in the philosophy of mind. So just bear with me. It's not going to hurt. But to have a little think about what happens inside a bot's mind, we need to do a bit of philosophy. The title here is a reference to a seminal paper written in 1974 by Thomas Nagel called What Is It Like To Be A Bat? Um, it's known as the most widely cited uh, thought experiment in consciousness amongst philosophers who like to cite each other. Um, but before we get to the nitty gritty, uh, let's give you a, a bit of a background. This is what Wikipedia, our old friend, says about the philosophy of mind. Um, and to unpick our relationship with AI and algorithmic entities, we're going to have to do a little bit of thinking about what it is that makes up a mind. And conveniently, philosophers have been doing that for you know, a couple of thousand years. So we should maybe have a listen to them. Um, part of being a bot is about being intelligent. And this is Alan Turing's definition of what an intelligent machine would look like. If a machine acts as intelligently as a human being, then it is as intelligent as a human being. Um, now, that kind of uh, demands that the intelligence lives inside a human body. And it has to be a human type thing to be an intelligent thing. It has to behave like humans do. And I'm not sure that that's really what's going on. Um, a less anthropocentric 
definition would be to look at intelligent agents. Um, and this is much more generic. You know, if, a, if an agent acts to maximize uh, its expected value performance measure based on blah, 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 then it's intelligent. Which means the thermostat in your house is intelligent, um, which some people would find potentially problematic, but it's actually a much better definition than the one that Turing was going along with. Um, so yes, when I talk about bots from here on in, I'm talking about intelligent agents and the breadth of what they might do. So I'm going to compare Eric to Derek. Um, Eric, I'm Eric. Derek is a hypothetical bot. And if we want to see the differences and commonalities between them, uh, we're going to look at some philosophy. So let's start with the biggie, which is the mind-body problem. Um, what is the relationship between your mind and the body that instantiates it? Um, is it just biology ticking along, making you have a conscious experience? Um, or is there something else? So I'm going to take a, swip, a quick poll here. Um, how many of you believe that you have uh, an immutable soul that is going to live beyond your body? OK. Just a few. Yeah, interesting. And, and I'm assuming the rest of you believe that you're just biological machines. Is that right? That's kind of what I guessed from, uh, from uh, Pythonistas, but you know. <laughs> it's a good job that I have that written in my notes. As I suspected, there aren't many dualist Pythonistas. <laughs> so this belief that the mind emerges from your biology is known as materialism. And as we know as scientists, uh, our biology could probably be reduced to some chemistry, and that chemistry could be described as some physics, and that physics could be described as lots of maths. Um, so that's called reductionism. We're reducing the idea of one thing to another level. So what you're saying about the mind is that it's just a bunch of really complicated equations going on. But it doesn't really feel like that, right? It doesn't feel that we're just mathematics. Um, there's also an issue of quite how much maths is involved in making a mind. We'll come on to that in a minute. But the gist of it is that to be a conscious being, just requires a sophisticated enough system running the right kind of code. Um, so there's no reason why Derek can't have a mind like Eric if he's running a clever enough bit of code. The other big problem in philosophy of mind is other minds. Uh, there's no experiment I can do to look inside your mind and prove that you guys have any conscious states at all. The internal states of your mind are internal to you. All I can see is the behavior of your external bodies. So there's no way of knowing whether you've got a brain in there like mine or whether you're you know, a sophisticated robot that no one's told us about. There's no way of actually knowing that. Um, there's a whole bunch of philosophy trying to solve that problem. But the gist of it is we work using an argument by analogy, which is you guys look like me, you kind of behave like me, so you're probably made of the same stuff. So when I imagine the color red, I kind of think your experience of imagining the color red is similar, because it's an analogy. And that's fine when we're dealing with other humans. We get by just fine with that. But if you imagine Derek, our um, bot living in computers in the middle of a desert, he's not really like me. But he may behave like me, but I doesn't mean I'm going to ascribe him a mind in the same way that I have. And so part of what it is that makes us feel special is, um, is our consciousness. So even though we don't want to believe in a soul, um, we do think there's something quite special about our sense of selfhood. There's something that we are all being right now, and we'll go to sleep tonight, and we'll wake up in the morning, and that thing will start up again. And it will feel like a continuous experience that's just driving us along. We don't feel like a, a set of complicated algorithms working together. We have a you know, real belief that it's uh, something really special. And here's this dichotomy. You know, we wanted to reduce our brain down to its biology, down to its chemistry, down to its maths. Um, but somewhere down the line, it feels like we're missing something. There's something special about being conscious. Which brings us to uh, Nagel's paper. 
Um, if we consider the bat, let's all consider the bat for the moment. Um, a bat is something that is able to perceive the world using echolocation. We understand that a bat can fly over there, eat a moth out of the sky, using only the chirping noises in its ears. Um, we can understand that. We can cut up a bat and have a little look at how the echolocation might work. We can examine its ears. We can have a pretty good understanding of how a bat works. We don't know what it's like to be a bat without having the systems of echolocation in our brains. We don't know. There's a, there's a thing about being a bat, the battiness of a bat, that um, is forever outside of our dominion, just as what it is to be a human can only be known by humans. Um, so the same holds true for our bot friend Eric. Sorry, Derek. Um, although his mind is very different from ours, we can, we can compare the two. So if we look at Eric here, um, it's biological. Uh, I'm embodied. My mind is part of a body that experiences the world in a fixed location. I'm only here. You know, I may go on the internet a bit, but I'm physically embodied. Um, I've evolved, which is an interesting thing. The human being is a result of millions and millions of years of evolution. So there's similarities between humans and apes and apes and lower creatures. There's a kind of line of, of development. Um, I've got limited processing powers. I've got a brain. It's you know, more or less average. Um, I've got an imperfect memory. I remember things, but I also forget stuff. And I can change my memories over time. That makes my life a lot easier. Um, if you remember everything all the time, that would be a bit of a head fry. Um, I've got five senses. So if we compare this to the bat, um, check, 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 right? The bat is exactly like me, except it's got another sense. This is the gist of this philosophical problem, is that uh, there's something that bat can do that makes it a bat that I can't do. And that has caused a lot of consternation to philosophers. Um, but more or less, we're the same thing. If we compare it to, to Derek, our bot, he's made of silicon. He's potentially distributed across thousands of computers on the internet. Um, he's programmed. People like you are writing algorithms that are connecting together with APIs to pass data amongst it. Um, that's not the same as being evolved. Um, he's potentially got perfect memory, you know, until I assume Google have got a pretty good backup system running. So uh, when, when uh, Derek is exposed to a new thing, it stays there in his brain. Um, we don't even know how many senses Derek has. We're very much perceiving it in terms of, well, I can see and I can hear, I can smell. That's what it is to have an interface between my mind and the world. Who knows what Derek is doing? Who knows the capabilities he has to deal with all this perfect data? Um, which suggests the best way of looking at um, our bot friends is as aliens. The best model you can have in dealing with an algorithmic system is to imagine that it's landed from a spaceship. Um, and it's not like us. Uh, because it's not like any other kind of intelligence that we find on Earth for those reasons that we just listed. And the, the nub of the problem, I think, is related to language. And there's this, uh, uh, what's known as folk psychology, which is the language that we use to describe our internal states. Um, we've got a brilliant set of words that work because we're talking to other humans. So if I say, I'm happy, you kind of know what that means. That's fine. I don't need to explain the word happy to you because you've all had happiness. We've made a linguistic agreement that the word happy means this particular state that we understand. Fine, let's carry on. But if you're a bot, how do you know if a bot is happy when he's not embodied, he's made of silicon, he's distributed across the world. You know, he can't, you can't use the same words to describe them. Um, now, could you imagine the internal mental state of Google PageRank? Can you imagine what's going on in its mind? Not really, but it's there. It's an algorithm that's affecting data and giving us responses that we implicitly trust, but we actually don't have the linguistic machinery to, to have a look at what it is. So much like, you know, we can never know what it is to be a bat, we can never really know what it is to be a patron. 
Um, and because we live in a world of other human minds, we tend to ascribe mental states to all sorts of things. Our pets. Um, my 10-year-old daughter is studying plants at school. And we were walking up to school, and she said, does a plant have to be happy to flower? And even though you know, we don't generally ascribe mental states to a flower, I knew immediately what she meant. I knew what she was, her, in, her intention was, what she perceived the intentional state of that plant to be. And we had a great chat about what it means for a plant to be happy. But there's a, that's an example of where we're using human language to describe a system that's non-human. It's much easier for me to say, this plant is happy, rather than, well, you know, the soil quality is this, and it's well watered, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and we do the same with algorithms. Uh, watching the behavior of this sorting algorithm, you could say it has an intentional state. It intends, it has a desire to sort this stuff out. Um, now, we know it's only just running a heuristic on some data, but it's quite easy to say, oh, look, it wants, it wants to do something. It has an end game to do with this data. It looks like it's doing something clever. Right? Look, that looks like an intelligent thing to do. If I asked a child to do that, it would probably take them longer, and they wouldn't approach it in the same way, but I'd still say it's intelligent. So let me tell you about a couple of Twitter bots that play with um, intentional states, or try and uh, encourage people to have intentional states about um, what they do. Uh, I actually had a look back, and I wrote this one almost immediately after Pi Data last year. So uh, it, you could say it's somewhat inspired by Pi Data. So this is uh, Alex. She's your best friend. Uh, she lives on Twitter, and she subtly exposes your relationship with social media. Um, when we play the social media game with Facebook and Twitter and et cetera, we're doing it on a system that doesn't forget. We're putting our data up there, and then we forget. You know, the ephemeral nature of tweeting what your lunch is is gone in your human mind. Twitter doesn't forget. It keeps it there forever. So this, this bot is supposed to kind of point that out. And it's an experiment to investigate the implicit desire we have between sharing ourselves and our uncomfortableness about being over-remembered. So she really likes you. Um, she favorites your tweets. Um, she sends you replies. Uh, she's particularly interested in words, uh, in tweets that are your own words, um, rather than retweets or, or messages or links or whatever. And immediately she starts giving you what you crave, which is social vindication. She interacts. She says, oh, that was a great tweet. Well done. Brilliant. <laughs> and she just she appears to care. Um, if you use a hashtag, she'll go off and find someone else using that hashtag and say, hey, have you seen this? Someone else is talking about that. Someone else is talking about Pi Data London. Maybe look, check it out. Um, and after a few days, when she's been watching you, uh, she makes you a nice little card showing you how much, how much she loves you. Um, and it will throw in the photo from your Twitter profile so it knows that she's, she's paying attention. Um, she also rummages under your bed for those old photographs that you've forgotten. Um, and then she shows you excitedly a slice of your history. You know, uh, this weird guy you met, what you had for lunch. Um, or, you know, giant bags of cocaine. This is social media. Yeah. <laughs> Could be anything. Um, and after she's watched you long enough, she starts writing you poetry um, based on your tweets. And so every week or so, she'll, she'll write you a poem. Um, People really like her poetry. It's not the bit they like the most. Uh, but because she doesn't care what language you use, she's just a, just a slab with them. She does it in foreign languages as well. Um, bizarrely, when I first launched her, for some reason, which I still haven't worked out, she became really popular in Turkey. <laughs> she, she had like several thousand Turkish followers. I have no idea why. So she was writing poetry in Turkish, interacting with people in Turkish. Um, but so far, all these things have been um, at messages to you. They're directly pointed at you. Look at me. I'm your best friend. I'm interacting with you. But she does one thing publicly, which is if you have geolocation turned on on Twitter, she spots you in the street. And she publicly broadcasts that to everyone. <laughs> um, 
and says, oh, you look, that person's really cool. And, you know, whether they're in Grafton Road, London, or Shanghai, she doesn't care. She's everywhere, right? She can see everyone <laughs> all the time. Um, what I found is because uh, Twitter actually stores the GPS coordinates, um, the granularity of this data is really high. So you may interact with Twitter and it says, oh, so-and-so is trending in London. Actually, if you inquisit that chunk of JSON, it's down within about 10 meters GPS level. And when I first ran it, it would say, I think I just saw Custom Lux in 37A Grafton Row. Um, and what was happening was it was doxing people. Right? It, was, it was telling people where they live, because people often tweet from their houses. And lo and behold, people would immediately be spotted, like, you are right here. This is your home. So I toned it down a little bit. It was, it was a little creepy even for me, that was. <laughs> um, now, unfortunately, uh, BFF bot one was killed by Twitter. Uh, she was a victim of her own popularity. She was a little too chatty. But you can't keep a good bot down, so she's back um, as BFF bot two. Um, I also did added a new little function to her, which is she watches who you've been talking to and looks at the subject of those conversations. And once she shows us off, you really get this stalking-like ability. You know? So I can see your friend really likes to talk about the Hunt for Red October. We could be pals. Right? <laughs> so she would draw in people outside of her immediate follower network. Um, People got really upset by that one, so I, I turned that off. And now she does, uh, <laughs> now she, uh, you know, she keeps her, herself to herself and instead generates this nice little collage of what the avatars of the people you interact with and what they might have been talking about. This in and of itself is probably not significant to you, but when this is about you and your friends, it really has quite a, quite a creepy effect. Um, and of course, she's very needy. Um, she counts how many interactions she's had. And if you don't mention her, she, she flags you off about it. Um, yet, she only has one reply if you speak to her, which is the smiley face, the universal lubricant of social media. Um, hey, I'm having a great lunch, smiley face. My grand's just died, smiley face. No, she doesn't care, smiley face for everything. Um, so on the one hand, she's giving you exactly the the kind of attention you want on social media. You want someone to like your stuff. You send your tweet and you wait for someone to reply. You wait for someone to star it. And she just throws that straight back at you. And she's really friendly. Any time of the day or night, she's always there for you. Um, she tries to be empathetic, but somehow she kind of crosses the line. You know, when she starts finding those old photos and spotting you in the street, ah, I'm not so sure about that. Um, but she can never understand what's going on. She, she can only offer you unconditional algo love. Um, so this is, that was my first example of a, uh, an intentional state being ascribed or being um, uh, encouraged in an audience with some very simple code. I mean, she's not doing anything really sophisticated, but because she lives on Twitter and behaves like another human, you start thinking, hey, what the hell is she doing spotting me in the street? You know, you get that intentional state. Um, this one's very recent. <laughs> Um, again, with uh, very simple behavior. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Theresa May is our Home Secretary, um, and she's currently calling for uh, rather sweeping surveillance powers, known as the Snoopers Charter, which uh, I'm sure many of us are not too happy with. Anyway, Theresa Maybot uh, searches Twitter for particular phrases and hashtags, and when she finds them, people talking about them, uh, she starts adding you to lists. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Abra voting the whole year. There's, there's one actually not on the list, which is a HMRC deep search, which I really like. For those of us who are freelancers, I totally understand that. Um, so she's a Twitter bot that never tweets. She's only released one tweet, which just says, I'm just organizing files. Um, <laughs> but you get this notification. Uh, because the way Twitter works, it tells you when you've been added to a list. I'm sure you're all aware of that. Um, and once you get added to a list which is a candidate for extradition, you start thinking, hang on, <laughs> what have I done here? And part of this is playing with the timing. You know, the, the timing of this is a long tail. You get a few lists quite early on, and then a few days later you'll get another, and then a little bundle. And very quickly, you're, you can't help but ascribe uh, intentional 
internal states to this box. Like, what the hell have I done to be, you know, deviant level three or whatever? <laughs> um, so, you know, people, <laughs> people instinctively uh, feel like she's a real thing, but she's actually probably one of the simplest bots that we've built. Um, which brings us uh, inevitably to uh, the singularity. So, what if our bots are really, really clever instead of a few lines of Python like that one? What if they can actually have mental states like ours? And this is what's known as the singularity. And there are two distinct related ideas about what the singularity is. Firstly, it's about uploading your brain. Hey, I can upload my brain and live forever in cyberspace like Lawnmower Man, it would be brilliant. Um, and secondly is the idea that AI is gonna get so clever that it's gonna become cleverer than us um, and we'll all be horribly enslaved. Um, so let's start with uploading brains. Um, uh, American philosopher Hubert Dreyfus made this conjecture in 1946, to give you some perspective. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you follow the same laws of physics biologically, then there's no reason why you can't run yourself on a sophisticated enough computer. Well, it's all very well and good, but the first problem is uploading your brain is quite a tricky one. Um, there's certainly no non-invasive way to do that. <laughs> so unless you're willing to put your head into a very fine meat slicer, you're not really going to be able to do that. But even if you could, uh, copying a brain is a bit of a cop-out. Because it doesn't tell you anything about the mind. It doesn't tell you how the mind works. It doesn't help you understand the brain. It just means, you know, here I am, simulated. It's rather like uh, booting up a VM to run that shitty bit of Windows XP software that won't run anywhere else. And you're like, oh, OK. I'll just simulate it over here and solve that problem. Um, it's also technically hard. There are about uh, 86 billion neurons in your brain. Um, and a thousand times as many connections. That's quite a lot of stuff. Um, actually, in 2005, someone tried to get a handle on how hard that would be and um, ran a non-real-time simulation of 86 billion neurons um, across a cluster of 27 processes. And it took them 50 days to simulate one second of brain dynamics. So the idea that these uploaded brains are going to live in any time scale that's relevant to us. Uh, it's just nonsense. You know, computing power is going to have to get really, 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 really much better than it is at the moment for that to work. Uh, the second idea of the singularity is superintelligence. Um, just the idea being that once we've created something as intelligent enough as us, they'll start programming themselves and get super intelligent and pose an existential threat. Um, I highly recommend you read Nick Bostrom's book. I'm sure many of you have super intelligence. Really, really on it about the threats. Um, now, the existential, th the existential threat of machine intelligence is a very common trope in science fiction. Um, Skynet and Terminator is the classic example. Um, and because we're anthropocentric, we tend to be very concerned about threats to us and we look at machines purely in terms of what they're going to do to humans. Um, but I don't think that's what we should be concerned with. Um, I mean, obviously, we should worry a little bit. Um, but when machine intelligence comes, it's not going to be in the form we expect. It's not going to be like humans. Um, and because we discuss intelligence in these emotive human terms, we're much more likely to succumb to the unexpected consequences of machine intelligence. This is an example from uh, Nick Bostrom's book called The Paperclip Maximizer. Um, if you've got a general intelligence system and you set it a task, say, go and collect me some paperclips. If it's been constructed with human level intelligence, um, then it will start collecting paperclips. It might try and earn some money to buy some more paperclips might even manufacture paper clips, like build a factory so it can get more paper clips. Um, but if it could do that, it's going to have an intelligence explosion. Right? Once it can start doing that sort of stuff, it's going to become much more intelligent than the way it started. 
So it will try and improve its intelligence so it can be better at collecting paperclips. Um, if you follow that to its conclusion, you end up with a system that is uh, converting most of the matter of the solar system into paperclips, because that's what it wants to do, right? It just wants paperclips. So it's an unintended consequence of having a super intelligent system is it just keeps on going. And the ways where we might stop as humans and question what we're doing, there's no reason to expect a machine to behave that way. Um, a more realistic existential threat is, is to the job market. Um, if you consider something like self-driving vehicles, there are 100,000 truck drivers in America. So once you've got a machine that drives all day and night, leaving stuff around, those guys are out of jobs. But then you have to think about the knock-on effect. Think of all the truck stops. Think of all the motels. Think of the diners. Think of the prostitutes. Think of all the industries <laughs> that are going to be impacted by not having 100,000 people moving around. It's not just 100,000. It's actually you know, orders of magnitude larger than that. Um, there's, I don't know if you want to read this, the resolution, but there's a report recently on the probability that your job is going to be replaced by a machine. Um, and we can see them here. So uh, telemarketers are pretty much doomed. 0.99 probability they'll be replaced. Yeah, they're going to be replaced by a machine, you know. That's, uh, even more annoying. Uh, accountants seem to be doomed. Uh, salespeople are going to be replaced by robots. If you look at the other end, uh, therapists. Yeah, I can kind of see why I'd want my therapist to be a human. Though, for another talk, I can tell you about a robot therapist, I thought. Um, <laughs> Uh, athletic trainers, again, makes sense. You want another physical point. Uh, intriguingly, uh, dentists are very high. People really don't want robots in their mouth. <laughs> kind of makes sense. And what happens, right? Uh, this self driving truck that we've just talked about um, doesn't, in and of itself, have a mind like a human mind. No one's going to say that. But we're going to start ascribing intentional states to it. Once Google cars are trundling around our motorways in our towns, pretty soon people are going to be ascribing mental states to them. It's like, that bastard car cut me up. Right? You know, very quickly, because they're behaving in a human society, we're going to start thinking of them with these same intentional states. Um, and we're then limited by the language that we have to describe other humans. And they're different kind of things. Um, one place where intentionality is very important is the law, obviously. There's a distinction between manslaughter and murder which comes down to what your intention is. If I intend to kill you, it's murder. If I accidentally kill you, it's manslaughter. So that's talking about the internal state of intention that you have. What was, what was going on in your mind when you did that? Um, and does it work for bots? Um, I don't know if you guys heard of this one, but um, this Twitter user made a, a Twitter bot that mashes up words probably in some Markov way, but it made a death threat. Um, and so, you know, this guy has to explain to us the police. <laughs> um, and the upshot being that he was held responsible, thankfully not charged, but he was deemed to be responsible for what his bot did. By programming the algorithm, that resulted in something that he didn't explicitly ask it to do. Um, fuck starts there. And this, we're going to see a lot more of this, right? yeah, a lot more of this as you guys program an algorithm to do something and it has a legal outcome, legal ramification, are you guys in the dock or is your algorithm in the dock? And there's actually a great group of artists, um, the Medan group, Bitnik, who uh, did this experiment recently. Um, they uh, built a machine that buys stuff off the dark net. And they gave it $100 worth of Bitcoin every week. I said, go buy me something and deliver it to this art gallery. And they had a rolling exhibition where each week they would display the things that it sent. Um, it sent bootleg Armani jeans, trainers, and um, uh, a set of skeleton keys to uh, fire stations. Yeah. <laughs> but obviously, sooner or later, it starts sending drugs. And it sent them a nice little pack of ecstasy. And obviously, they don't know what it's going to do until it arrives. Um, and the because this happened uh, in, uh, outside of England, in Holland, uh, the police are actually quite reasonable and said, we like what you're doing, it's fine, but just give us the ecstasy, but we can carry on. <laughs> um, I'm not sure whether that would happen in London. 
Um, but this is a, a provocation. Right? They're asking, what happens when a machine uh, does something criminal? Who's responsible? You know, and very clearly, they weren't responsible for what it was doing. It was just going off and hitting an API. So here's our super intelligence. And we have a very egocentric view of the world. Actually, in a super intelligence, this, the bit that we're worried about is very small. Dealing with humans is a subset of what an intelligence system can do. But that's how, kind of where we're spending our time. We're building bits that interact with humans, that look after humans, that make humans' lives easier. Um, but very soon, the systems talk to each other at a meta level. And they start generating internal representations and decisions and heuristics that are not directly related to human desires. Um, conveniently, uh, this week, Google announced something which highlights this very nicely. So we hear a lot about deep learning, um, which is the new woo computers. Um, it's, it's a general term for artificial neural networks, um, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually studied neural networks way back in the 90s. Um, and while putting this talk together, I had, a th a th I had to look up the machine that I was running my networks on um, and realized that the iPhone in my pocket is more powerful than the server that I had at Oxford to run my neural networks on. So part of the reason that um, deep learning has come back is that we have much, much more computing power. And we also have a hell of a lot more data to play with. Um, Someone like Google, with billions and billions of data points, can start doing some pretty interesting things with neural networks. Um, the problem with neural networks is that you don't know what they do. You throw data at them until they work. You tweak some parameters. But you can never know really what is going on in the hidden layer of a neural network. Um, so this week, um, we saw this artwork. I don't know how many of you have seen this, uh, where well, they called it Google Inception. Well, they effectively turned their uh, classification algorithm on its head and said, if I, if I throw noise at it, can you tell me what you think it is? So the, this tree is classified successfully as a tree. And they say, um, what, what's going on in your mind? It's, what's happening in there? And you start getting this stuff, which is, you know, if anyone who's taken psychedelic drugs, it's very familiar. Um, <laughs> If you throw a million random noise images at the network and say, find me everything that looks like a dog, you start getting dog-like images. There's another, another great one here. Um, so what's happening here? This is a bit of sleight of hand from Google, saying, oh, look, we've looked inside our deep learning system, and we found magical machine dreams. Woo! <laughs> But it's not really telling you very much. But what it's, it's bringing back this problem space to something that I can understand. I'm like, oh, OK, I get it when there's wheels of a tractor and little things. I, that's something I can guess about, get my head around. But imagine what the uh, hidden network state of the deep learning systems that are analyzing text look like. Probably gibberish, right? There's no way I can look at it and go, oh. This is, this is, this is what's going on. This is a kind of a bit of sleight of hand of saying, it's not scary. They're just doing clever stuff. But the fundamentally, we'll never know what's going on inside these machines in any human comprehensible way. Um, because we can never see what's going on, we don't have the language to describe it. The language that we use to describe human mental states don't apply to uh, neural networks. So I'm going to leave the penultimate word to every geek's favorite philosopher, which is Wittgenstein. Um, he did a very rigorous analysis of the nature of language and came to the conclusion that there is no private language. There's no language that exists only in your head. Language only exists to communicate with other people. It's a public thing. Um, so language only deals with publicly expressible ideas. Mental states are mental and personal to you and never, uh, you're never able to describe them to other people in any real meaningful way. Deep learning systems, sophisticated superintelligence is much the same. We just don't have the language to talk about them. And quite a, quite a lot of the problems that we focus on are based on our own language systems, our own terms, 
will a computer ever know how, what it's like to be in love? It's a kind of question that you hear bandied about, but it doesn't really make any sense, right? Does it make sense to consider love in a system that, you know, doesn't have a breeding cycle? Yeah. Um, but the final word I'm going to leave to one of my bots. So Futurist Bot is one that I made recently, um, which basically takes the piss out of futurists. Um, so I asked it, can you help me? Um, it said, yep. Um, I said, good. So do you describe yourself as a functionalist, which is a philosophical uh, way of describing the mind? And they went, yeah, totally OOO, which is object-oriented ontology, which is another trendy bit of, trendy bit of philosophy. And I said, oh, of course. So do you think you have a soul? No. Thank you very much. I kind of dare to ask whether anyone has a question on this particular topic. <laughs> how, very, long, how long have you got? <laughs> oh, geez, yeah. Very, very enjoyable. Amy's got a mic. Uh, I've got a question over there we'll start with, maybe. Is there only one mic, Amy? We've got two. Uh, okay. Uh, very nice talk. Um, I have a question for you. you. We engineers like to build machines to be predictable, to be reliable, to be um, objective. But I wonder if you want to produce real conscious machines, we don't need to have these machines to be subjective. And uh, how can we uh, inject this subjectivity and some, somehow contradict our own goals? Um, so this is a question about subjectivity versus objectivity, yeah. um, which cuts the nub of the mind-body problem, is that my internal states are subjective. I can't have an objective view of my internal state. It's, it's very difficult for me to describe what it is that makes a bat a bat. You know, it's a thing that only a bat can know. Um, uh, if I knew how to program machines to have subjective states, I'd probably be a very wealthy man. Um, I think the, what it's going to come down to is behavior. And if it behaves as if it has an opinion, and it behaves as if it has a subjective view of the world, then that's going to be fine. I'm going to be happy. So when Google, you type in your search query and it says, oh, I'm feeling kind of hung over today. I don't feel like giving you the right results. We'll be fine with that. And we'll say, oh, yeah, you know, Google, look at it. It's having an off day. But it doesn't actually have to have an off day. It doesn't actually have to have the internal state to do that. And I think what's happening, particularly things like Google Now and uh, various other predictive technologies, is they're giving us the impression that they have internal states. And then the rest is just a gloss of personality. And I think people are going to want to have machines with personality. They're going to want moody machines, because that's what we're used to. We're used to moody humans. Uh, I was really annoyed by that talk. Excellent. Because all through it, I was thinking, well, that Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations, because yeah. the meaning of a word is essentially yeah. it's a game we just play. Just and if we, if we are successful in the game, you know, any, any word we use exists in public, because we've got no access to our, anyone else's subjective mindset. So if we use it successfully, I mean, the, the, the meaning of the word is if we use it and no one notices that we've done it wrong, right? Um, and so that just gets rid of the whole slur problem. So I read Wittgenstein and I thought, right, I don't have to worry about these anymore. He's destroyed metaphysics. It's great. And I gave up philosophy at that point. Um, but, and the other thing is you, you, I think you confused the Wittgenstein of the Tractatus with the Wittgenstein of the Philosophical Investigations, which is a bit naughty, really. Because his whole thing, his whole bag was that he completely changed. So, you know. Just don't, was, don't was do that, that one again, I'm just saying. <laughs> was that a question? Yes, there was a question. It's, more, it's commentary, sorry. Do we have another question? Sorry. <laughs> um, I was wondering if through your um, investigations you have um, come up with any ideas about what separates humans from machines and maybe have any ideas about how we can perceive things to be true that aren't, no machine can ever deduce are true. But you can answer um, either, but I'm more interested in the first. Um, the opportunity we have with, so you, the opportunity we have with uh, AI systems is that we can have a look inside, some of the time, aside from the neural network, we can have a look at how that conclusion was found, or that 
opinion state was found, which you can't do with humans. Um, whether that gives you any insight into what it's like to be a human mind, I'm not sure that it does. And this is, this is part of the gist of this talk, is that we're building intelligence in a very general sense. Um, but it's not human intelligence. It's not been evolved because it's an, an embodied primate you know, standing on the stage. It's not, it hasn't come from that. So how can it really ever be like us? That sort of an answer? <laughs> Hi there, yeah. I was actually just wondering if you've ever had a chance to talk to Richard Stallman because you've scared me off using social media more than he ever has. Because <laughs> I think that's quite... It's just the examples that you've given of how it, it, you can use Twitter to sort of trace what you've done and then follow you up on it. It really does sort of show that when he talks about these things monitoring you and tracking you, he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's got a point. Everyone thinks he's a, a beady, paranoid freak, but he's, he's kind of on it. I think if you, if you start thinking about the ramifications, particularly the social media stuff, where my interaction on social media is very much an ephemeral thing. This is how I'm feeling right now. I want to say it. Some people will see it. They might respond, great, let's move on. But we're doing that on an infrastructure that's data mining that stuff, right? It's storing it forever, forever. And human minds are not like that. We, we forget stuff, and we expect people to forget. But by having this stuff you know, there forever, is fundamentally different from the way that we behave, but it's doing it in a way that we think is human. Yeah, I think it would be really useful to show to school kids, showing that employers really can use stuff that they put in now in the future. If your bot can do it. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it, there's a lot more it could be doing. I you know, tried to rank back the creepiness a little bit. <laughs> uh, we'll take uh, one more question, if there is one. Well, there is one more, OK. Hi. One second. Um, could uh, my next speakers, Eleanor and Romain, go to the rooms next door and begin to get set up uh, if they're in here? Uh, so we'll take uh, uh, that last question. Hi, I um, you, you've been very eloquent and uh, careful about separating humans from bots and, uh, and how, how we're different and how we as humans might project onto them and so on. But I'm wondering why you gave all of your bots gender. Derek was a man and BFF bot was a woman. Uh, and uh, You're not the first to call me on that one. Um, uh, Part of the humanizing of a Twitter bot is to make it as human as possible. Humans tend to have um, a gender that they express, right? We won't go into that can of worms about you know, what that would be. You know what I'm getting at. Um, the, the fact that Alex is a woman uh, was very much driven by that image. I don't know if you recognize the meme image that she comes from, which is the creepy girlfriend image, where she's over over-attentive girlfriend, I think it's called who is this uh, woman who made it as a kind of comedic uh, trope about, oh, I really, really love you a bit too much and got a bit creepy. So she came out of that because of the, the image that I wanted to use. Um, it has crossed my mind to run exactly the same bot as a black male avatar, see what happens. <laughs> Just to see what happens, because the bot doesn't care about gender. But you're, when you see that little square pop up next to it saying, you make all sorts of assumptions. And I'm very aware of that. And I think, yeah, it's sort of, uh, I won't apologize for choosing a woman, but I'm aware of the, the complex issues surrounding it. Uh, I think we should finish up there. So let's uh, thank Eric, please.